I'm standing in once again for David Morris, whose wife is unwell, uh, so has sent his apologies to you today. I'm Roger Johnson. Uh, I am responsible for organising the programme. Uh, and if any of you have any ideas for the talks for 90, uh, both, and for 2020 and, for in, and into 2021, uh, do bend my ear at some point. I'm always uh, looking for ideas. We're booked up between September and Christmas. Good news. I've just offered January. So anybody who, if you have ideas between February and May 2021, uh, I'm uh, gratefully receivable. Well, uh, that said, uh, it's a delight today to welcome Dr. Jonathan Swinton, who uh, some years ago, I think I can say that safely, uh, got a PhD in mathematics oh, yeah. and uh, has lived for uh, a number of years uh, in Manchester. The family grew up in Manchester and uh, he was uh, also at one time uh, a fellow of King's College in Cambridge. Um, so uh, he's written a book. There are some copies at the back, which I think are probably for sale. Uh, if, and uh, this is the book of the talk. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome him. We've had many talks all about uh, computers in Manchester and about Alan Turing. And uh, this really brings both Manchester and Alan Turing uh, together in a single talk. So, Jonathan, uh, welcome to CCS. Look forward to your presentation. Thank you. So, I'm told that this mic is on. Is that working? Can you hear me as well? No, I can you tell me? If, so, if you start waving, you start using that. You stop. Okay, so yes, I am here to primarily to sell my book. I will tell you right at the beginning that if you leave without buying a copy, it will cost you £10. <laughs> 15 pounds from me, and you walk out the door, it will be 25 quid from the local bookshop. Although I've learned quite a lot about Amazon's pricing system. Right. So, uh, yeah, um, uh, that was quite a good introduction because one of the C's of this book was for me the experience of moving from Cambridge to Manchester. Um, and uh, to jump Back to Manchester. How many people in this room have been to where these plaques are in Manchester on the computer science department? What was the place that they were? Hands of people. So, Manchester has a, a decent claim, and I should say this is the most intimidating audience I've ever spoken to. Because <laughs> <laughs> you not only build these early computers, you've written books about building these early computers. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I partly came to learn, uh, so do, don't hesitate to interrupt, but only at the end and after. <laughs> um, on the complex in the centre of Manchester University, just next to where the atom was split, it's an extraordinary street, uh, there are two plaques. And the first plaque, well, one plaque, the one you would see at the front of the building, in fact, and it faces south, is to Alan Matheson Turing, a creator of computer science. And Turing was indeed a reader in mathematics at the University of Manchester from 1948 to 1954. There's another plaque but they're not adjacent, as this slide might suggest to you. To see the other plaque, you have to walk in a big detour around to the back of the building. It's about five minutes walk, and you'll see another plaque of Freddie, Freddie Williams and Tom Kilburn, creators of the first stored program computer. Now, these two plaques are both entirely accurate. And nothing I really say in this talk is about anyone writing histories that are untrue. Right? I'm not taking credit away from anyone. I'm not saying that things didn't happen that did happen. Uh, I just want to think about some different perspectives on why these two plaques might have appeared. And one thing you might notice first of all is Tom Kilburn is described as a graduate of the University of Manchester, which is entirely true. But he wasn't an undergraduate at the University of Manchester, he actually was an undergraduate at the University of Cambridge. Right? So these words are beginning already to slide around a little bit in terms of your expectations. So two plaques. And one of these plaques tells a story that has been told, particularly in Manchester, continuously since the events of 1948. And I'm going to reprise part of that. And how many people came to Simon's talk? 
uh, last year. Anyone started that one to talk on the computer? So another book, which I'm afraid I'm not going to take any, I'm not going to sell, uh, but I don't know if you've got any copies in the Simon. Right, but uh, and, uh, the best book by a long way on the history of the early Manchester computing, Simon's recent book that he talked about uh, last year. Um, uh, and I draw on that quite heavily from what I'm going to talk about. And it's a story that starts in the war, right? So um, uh, this is a woman in a factory uh, in uh, North Manchester. And what she's doing is she's uh, handcrafting the cathode ray tubes that were being used in the radar sets that by the middle and the end of the war were being churned out in their thousands <coughs> to go along with the bombers that were also being built in Manchester. Manchester, uh, unlike uh, London, didn't really suffer that much from the Blitz. Uh, it's a major centre of engineering. It actually does economically rather well out of the war. So there's a great tradition in Manchester of elect practical electronic engineering happening. Uh, and that's this wartime uh, uh, energy is pushing things forward. And what does Freddie Williams remember? First of all, he says, I never was a mathematician. And he says, I didn't even know about binary. Right? The man who invents a computer doesn't know about binary. But when the specification of the storage system was explained to me, I could grasp what was wanted. The CRT tube storage system was the outcome. What's he talking about? Well, what Freddie Williams does is he invents the world's first practical computer memory. And even before he's come to Manchester, he's developed a device for taking those <coughs> cathode ray tubes, which have been developed with massive use for different purposes, displaying a dot on the front, being able to detect that dot reliably, send the signal round to the back, and you've got a memory. One bit memory before he comes to Cambridge, before he comes to Manchester, <coughs> that's what said. Um, uh, and, he, uh, and what happens when he comes to Manchester? Well, he brings with him a couple of um, uh, people from, from telecommunications research establishment. And these people, quite rightly, believe that they're the aristocrats of the science war. Right? These are the electronic geniuses, it's an appropriate word, who give Britain radar, right? the first fighting country in the world to have effective radar systems. So they are the stars, and they come to Manchester for this new problem of implementing computer memory. And they're very practical engineers, as they had to be during the war, if not for uh, professional reasons. <coughs> Some words in there. Um, uh, and uh, in order to demonstrate, you know, just the idea of computer memory, a pattern, is not enough. You need to build a test rig that shows that it works. And so this rig. The baby is built to show that the memory system works. And in the middle of the baby is one of those cathode ray tubes with the Williams or the William Kilburn storage system on it. And as some of you uh, may have seen, some of you may even have actually, has anyone actually assembled part of the baby? See me. Right, so in the 1990s, the Computer Conservation Society did a fantastic job, which I hope Science Museum will always be grateful for them, of reconstructing the baby. And it sits and it's one of the major stars in Manchester now. Uh, this kit that, crucially, in the history telling, on, in June 1948, ran what can fairly be claimed to be the first computer program in the world. Right, now, this is not a talk where I'm going to argue about what we're first to are, but it's got a good claim to be the first computer program. And it's run as a demonstration of this computer memory. And as I said, uh, people come from TRE to help build this project. One of those people is a very young man called Tom Kilburn, who has been seen and just been in Cambridge. Uh, and Tom Kilburn comes as William's assistant. Uh, he was the second choice of the assistant, because the first one said there was not going to be any future in this technology. <laughs> um, uh, he comes, and Tom Kilburn doesn't make that mistake. Tom Kilburn makes this his life work and his life success. So he's sitting in this room in Manchester University. It's a tiled room, uh, and the engineers later remember it as late lavatorial. <laughs> That's a really characteristic response, because the reason it's tiled is because it's in the physics department. And it was the physics department where 20, 30 years earlier, people were splitting the atom. Right? It's, it's tiled so you can keep it clean. They were actually doing this in one of the most highly developed scientific spaces of the 20th century. But the engineer's culture is to say, well, you know, we had to make do with string and ceiling wax and in the laboratory. Okay. So it's, it's just how you would describe what you're doing. So he's sitting working on expanding this rig, as they do over the next few years. And the way Tom Kilburn tells the story, I was just sitting there one day, and this guy walks in, 
And he just happened to be somebody high up in the Ministry of Defence, the Ministry of Supply. Uh, and then, next thing he knows, before the end of the month is out, a letter comes from the Ministry of Defence, effectively, to, not to the university, but to Ferranti, that local electronic firm that was building those cathode ray tubes. And it says, dear Ferranti, here is a hundred grand. Right, this is 1940, uh, I'm not sure what year it is, 1948, 1948. 100,000 pounds, the government, right, this is austerity Britain. They're spending 100,000 pounds to turn this machine into, this prototype, into a commercial machine. And at this point you have to think, well, how did you know what to build, right? If this is the first computer in the world, <coughs> how do you know what it needs to look like? And that's where the memories differ very, sort of, a little bit. Right? So Freddie Williams says, well, uh, they took us by the hand, he's talking about the mathematicians, and they said that numbers lived in houses. Right? The simplest and pithiest explanation of programming you can imagine. Tom Kilburn says, where I got the idea from, I've got no idea. Right, this is many decades later. And for Tom Kilburn, the idea of programming is just like bleeding obvious. Right? Once you've built this machine, this is the difficult bit, and then running a program on it is the easy bit. So it takes half an hour or an hour to explain the program. And he claimed later in life that the very first program, a well-known program, he wrote that, he claimed, on the back of an envelope on his training from Dewsbury. Right, so that's the claim. But that check from the Ministry of Defence isn't the only piece of large S. They get a building, right? So they move out of that laboratorial space and they move down, they move into a new building. Uh, again, 1948, there's not much building going on. And that, that plaque you saw Tyler Turing is now stands about here. You can still go and see this building um, on Cooper Street in Manchester. And um, uh, Tom Kilburn gets uh, an office in it for Mr. Kilburn. Um, and over the next couple of years, he builds a team. Freddie Williams uh, rather wisely decides that one brilliant success out of one is enough. So he retires from computer design, effectively does this. It becomes Tom's project. He becomes director of this laboratory. And over the next few years, they commercialize a series of prototypes. And the first one, the fr direct fruit of that £100,000 from the government, is what becomes the Ferranti Mark I. And so in 1951, that's ready to be, it's allegedly, it's the first computer ever sold. And it's true that it's, it was delivered to Manchester University before any other commercial computer was sold in February 1951. But like every computer before and since, when it was delivered, it didn't work. And it's not actually until the summer that people are actually able to run uh, any detectable program. On it. But they do get it working. And to, to celebrate and to market that fact, here is Tom Kilburn. He's leaning over the console with two Ferranti sales engineers, um, Brian Pollard and is it uh, Keith Monster. Keith Monster. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I suspect, uh, you might disagree with someone, I suspect these two don't know how to run the machine. <laughs> they weren't sales engineers. They weren't sales They weren't. They weren't sales. They weren't, they weren't in a sales function, but they're running the team that built this machine rather than necessarily being experts at it. Tom is leaning over at this, um, at his project, right? He has led this commercialization, uh, worked with Ferranti very closely. And it's perhaps not unimportant to mention that he gets paid quite well for it. So both Freddie Williams, Tom Kilburn, and Alan Turing get substantial consultancy payments from Ferranti out of that hundred grand. Um, uh, large yes, back into back into their personal bank accounts. So they sent, this machine is ready, and since this is a computer conservation society, and this picture is too beautiful not to show, there are some fantastic colour photographs, and I hope Simon showed some last uh, last year, and there's some more in his book of that early Manchester computer. Um, so I'm just showing it because it's beautiful, or pretty, or at least tinted by age into a nice colour. But let's get back to I, I'm not a professional historian, and this claims to be a work of history. Um, um, and the first thing I realised, or one of the things I realised, was that I'd always thought people in the past lived in black and white. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> black and white turned out to be a theme in this book. So the University of Manchester, this is the Man University of Manchester in the 1950s, like London, like Cambridge, is covered in coal soot. Right? 
Now, in Cambridge and in London, that's the mark that your home is warm, that you, the trains are working. In Manchester, it's got this additional signifier that there's work. There is work in the mills, in, the, in Ferranti, uh, in the Metrovitz, in these big engineering companies. So people don't resent this dirt. Uh, and one of the consequences of it, particularly post-war, this is the, uh, those of you who know Manchester, this is the Oxford Road, this is the Victorian building, Katie, the, the buildings we've been talking about are just here. In fact, this little building here is, the, is uh, what you were looking at the plans of. There's the Kilburn plaque, and you can see the walk you have to go around to the... Don't, you know, don't, don't the street, is it? Uh, I think this is Dover Street and this is no, Dover Street. No, Dover Street is... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I got one review <laughs> in Manchester from a thing called Manchester Litter and Phil um, oh. Society, which was in general, well, I could have all of us like more generous reviews, but the only actual specific criticism was that was, there wasn't a map of the Oxford Road in it, which is a bit irritating because there are three maps of the Oxford Road. <laughs> well, but, okay, you probably don't really care about that quite as much as I do. Right, so, up here, <coughs> is the new building. So Kilburn's project is so successful, this electrical engineering department becomes a really key part of the post-war university. And if you go to Manchester today, this whole segment, which in the 1950s was surrounded by working class housing, covering growth, has been knocked down and replaced by a modern, well mainly went up in the 60s, um, uh, education precinct. And the very first part of it was this building, which becomes the new department of electrical engineering. And the next generations of Ferranti computers go into this building. Uh, and some of you are making some memories of that, that time. And if you go in the, uh, uh, if you the University Archive, this is the, these are photographs from the opening of that building. And here's um, Tom Kilburn, uh, Freddie Williams, I've got this right around, staring at each other a little bit suspiciously. I don't know the names of any of the women in these pictures. Right. I, 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 do you think this? Do you think that might be Cicely Parkwell? I'm not sure. No. <coughs> you've got Mrs. Brooker. You've got Tony Brooker there. Right. Uh, you've got Mrs. Williams there. So this is a this is a new department which is opened up and people are um, celebrating quite rightly. And by the 1960s, Tom <coughs> has become the first professor of computer engineering. Uh, and according to this, uh, his, this newspaper account, he was invited by Professor Williams to Manchester University to do research. He's working on a new computer, the Atlas, which will be three million times faster than the human brain, right? which is a, a unit of computer speed known only to journalists. <laughs> <laughs> and quite rightly, you know, there were profiles of him in the newspaper, quite rightly, the university in the 1970s, I guess, builds an entire building to house what's then a kind of going to be a mainframe. Um, uh, an architectural historian described this as a place where monks would tend the computer. You know, do mass with the computer. Uh, I, I, I'm a bit keen on this part. So it's a success. It's an engineering success. But there is still some residual, I mean, I think a chip on his shoulder is perhaps too strong. This is a, a quote not from Tom Kilburn, who was a rather um, who was rather discreet, I think I'd say. Uh, this is from Freddie Williams. He gave an after-dinner speech to I think the Institute of Engineers or something like that in the sixties. And he said, "The engineer is inevitably associated with trade. The public at large in this country have not yet fully set aside the traditional aristocratic attitude that to be really tops, two things are required." A, one must be supremely good at something. B, the certain thing at which one is supremely good must be absolutely useless. <laughs> Traditionally, our universities were set up to meet the needs of well-to-do people. Right. Who's he having a go at? Well, easily, he's kind of having a go at classicists and people with PPE uh, or done history of Oxford and done but he's also having to go rather explicitly with these equations, and there's, there's a quite good joke about imagining numbers later on. Um, he's having to go at mathematicians. Right? Mathematicians are theoreticians who haven't given us any, who aren't useful to me, and who take credit away from us when we actually get things done. And he's not wrong. So if you walk inside that Kilburn building on the Oxford Road, you can just stroll in. Uh, you'll see a bunch of um, uh, uh, representations of the past 
And it's actually a relatively unusual uh, contemporary university teaching building. Most university teaching buildings are entirely ignorant of their parts. They, or there might be a little plaque or something like that. But this department is covered with mementos. And this is the largest of them. It's a big painting up on the wall. And you know, here are the heroes, legitimately, of first of all the baby, the, the digit store, and then the later developments of that engineering line. And if you wander around that department as you can, and if you're a fan of computer porn, by which I mean uh, beautiful photographs of um, computers. They've got bits of the NU5, the Atlas, um, and you can take pictures of these great achievements of British computer engineers. And there's a whole series of information panels really intended for students, but also visitors, to tell you about that um, heritage. And only one of those panels mentions Alan Turing. Right, and here is the panel. It's labelled Early Manchester Software. Right? At first, programs on the Ferranti Mark I, 1951, were written in binary using an ingenious but daunting system written by Alan Turing. It came to Manchester in October 1948, which of course crucially is after the baby has run that first program. Each group of five bits, blah, blah, blah. The program effectively works in a 32 based number system. Daunting but ingenious. Right? So, and we <coughs> see the memory that persists uh, within Manchester, within hardware computing engineering, of what the mathematicians bring. They bring really complicated ideas that get in the way of trying to solve your problems. Maybe that's true. Maybe early Manchester software running on the world's first running computer took a bit more than just. You know, maybe it took some creativity, and maybe the first time you learnt about it, it was really hard to understand. And then maybe 20, 30 years later, when you're so used to programming, it becomes easier to remember your own creativity, your own contributions, and it becomes harder to see where you got those ideas from. I, 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 I suggest that's a possibility. Because we know where Tom Kilburn got his ideas on the computer from, or his ideas on design of computer, among others. There's a whole raft of thinkers around at the time. There's a guy called Jack Good, who's a mathematician at Bletchley Park, comes to Manchester. There's von Neumann in the States. And there's Alan Turing, who he, along with Matthew, gives lectures that Tom Kilburn goes to. But yet, remembering where it came from, he's got no idea. And I, I'm not criticising him for saying that, I'm just saying, that enables you to see, you know, in his representation of his history, what was important to him. What was important to him, of course, was this experience of building this extraordinary engineering team. So, let's take that walk then round to the other side of the building and think about how things might look from a slightly different perspective. Right, so, Alan Matheson Turing, a creator of computer science, not a designer of engineering computers, apparently, the work as he was. And that's the story. The Turing story is one that I'm guessing in most of your brains, you're not surprised to find Cambridge in. So, so it's very tightly tied up with the cultural picture we have of Turing, that he's a boffin, a, 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 a Cambridge kind of thinky guy. You know, people put up with the fact he's quite difficult to deal with because he comes up with all these brilliant ideas or something like that. But certainly, Cambridge, uh, Turing is also in Cambridge a few years before Tom Pilgrim, and he has a very different kind of Cambridge. Turing is a, knows before he goes to Cambridge that he's a gay man. He arrives at King's College in Cambridge, which is one of the places where this post-First World War rejection of state and church morality has really taken hold. Right? So, you know, governments, churches took us into the First World War. Why should we believe what they say about, you know, who we should sleep with? And that, that idea dovetails rather nicely with another idea that's been going on in Cambridge for maybe 50, 60 years, since, Oliver, um, since the Oscar Wilde trial at least, which is that uh, if you love men, if you're a man that loves men, how do you talk about that? You can't talk about it in public. One of the ways you talk about that, of course, is through classics, through, through Greek literature, which is actually full of what you'd have to now say is sexual abuse in a contemporary culture, but nevertheless in a different culture. It's about same sex love. So he, he's part of this world, and it's also a world that really values the theoretical, the cerebral, and is not that keen on the, the engineering. And in a sense, one of the great 
exemplifies that is this guy, Max Newman, who is a, a, a hero of the story. So Max, um, Max actually comes from a probably less culturally privileged place than Tom Hilbert does, certainly than Alan Turing. Right? He's the son of a German immigrant. But Max has his magic ticket to the middle <coughs> classes, which he's really, really good at maths. So he goes to Cambridge, he becomes a fellow of St. John's, a young man, he becomes a lecturer, and he expects to stay in Cambridge the whole of his life teaching mathematics. And the first thing he does uh, to do that is to go to where the real expertise in maths is at the beginning of the 20th century, which is in Germany. So he goes off to Göttingen, and he listens to the great mathematical logicians. So you probably heard the name of Gödel, but there are other mathematicians, uh, so he's one of them. There are other logicians there, who one of the things they're trying to do is think about um, a problem that the German mathematician Hilbert posed at the very beginning of the century, which was this. How do you know the limits of mathematics? What are the things that mathematics can talk about and can't talk about? How do you prove that there are some things you can prove? You know, what's the circle that's got mathematics in it? If mathematics is all the things you can prove, can you prove what the boundary it is? And actually, most of the people at the time thought you were going to be able to do that, and then we'd know what math was, and then that would be, like, in a sense, a solved problem. Um, so Max comes back to Cambridge, and he gives a lecture uh, much smaller than this, uh, um, less intimidating than this, probably, to a bunch of graduate students and anyone who wants to know. Uh, and at the end of that lecture, they, everyone gets up and files out, no books for them to buy, but And a year after, a year after uh, that seminar, more or less, one of the students come back, comes back to him with a piece of paper. And that piece of paper is what we now know of as uncomputable numbers. Right, so this is a paper by Alan Turing, which is, uh, I want to say taught, I think perhaps more likely is mentioned in most computer science courses around the world. Right. If you want, if you think, oh, I, I want to learn about computer science, then in Buenos Aires, in Paris, in Germany, in France, you, know, you will hear about this paper that, of the Turing machine. And the reason Turing wrote this paper, create, I, Turing this particular paper, because I like the way he mentions that the consistency of this expression is clear from the meaning. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, he writes his paper in order to come up with an answer to that problem of Hilbert about the limits of mathematics and comes up with the answer that actually there are mathematical truths that you can't prove mechanically. So it's not a lecture about that or Gödel's theorem or anything like that. But the key point about this paper is that it comes up with a model of a general purpose computer. And in, certainly in Max Newman's brain, but I think probably also in Turing's, that idea of a general purpose computer is profoundly bound up with the idea of mathematical reasoning, right? Which is an idea that's only isn't the same as, but is not distant from the modern idea of software and the, the transformation. <clears throat> but then war comes. Now, what happens during the war to Turing is really well known. Um, uh, it goes off to Bletchley Park on the first day of the war, uh, and I'm not going to talk about what he did. Um, I think at all. But Max Newman, uh, it's not quite clear why he doesn't go to Bletchley Park at the beginning of the war. It, it's a suggestion that actually thought it would be a bit boring, uh, which of course it was for almost everybody working there, but not the cryptographers. Um, uh, but for whatever reason, actually one of the reasons he probably went is that there was a man called Patrick Blackett. Patrick Blackett had been through Cambridge, he was a professor of physics in Manchester at the time. Uh, and he writes to Newman, he says, I don't know, I think you really like this part, but you know, don't worry about it. There are, don't worry about it, there are a few too many kingsmen there. Or you'll find that the place is a hot place. <coughs> now, Max wasn't a king. So what this is, is um, deploying this Cambridge old boy network. You know, we're all kind of Cambridge, you know, we know that every college rivalries and nonsense, but we're all nervous you know, part of the elite. So that's what's deployed in some ways to persuade Max to go to um, Bletchley Park. And what Max does at Bletchley Park is he sits in an adjacent section to the one that Turing is in trying to solve the Enigma code. He's trying to solve a different code. And he realises that to solve his problem, what he needs to do is to do fast adding up, really, a lot of tallying. And he knows about electromechanical tallying because he'd seen it in Patrick Blackett's lab before the war. So he comes up with a sort of Heath Robinson machine, literally called Heath Robinson, to do this, which works in principle, but is way too slow in practice. So the mathematicians had an idea, but the engineering reality is it's not adequate. But someone then has a brilliant idea of probably seeing this principle um, 
of putting him together with a, a postal engineer called uh, Tommy Flowers. And Tommy Flowers really takes this design off Max Newman, goes away, and again comes back. But this time he comes back with a machine called the Colossus. And uh, it's not my place to sort of argue for where the Colossus sits in computing history, but it's definitely right there in a line that leads to the modern electronic computer. And one of the things, I, to me, one of the, th the most powerful things about it is a, a reminiscence. I don't think it is Jeff Good who remembers this, but one of the uh, people using this machine said, you know, a few weeks or months after we've had it in operation, we realised that if we replugged it a little bit, we could solve our problem more efficiently. So a software change, a change to the logical design of the machine, but not its physical design, created an immediate and impactful speed up. And that's a really, really profound thing to see in front of you. Right? That you can reprogram this machine. So there's a real power and a real need to um, uh, uh, use this machine. Max Newman sees this, of course. And he writes to von Neumann you know, over in America, who's sort of uh, leading Amer American thought about the computer. And he says, after the war, I'm going to go to Manchester uh, and I'm going to set up a laboratory for doing mathematics with computers. I want to explore how you can think with computers. So Max Newman is not interested in doing lots of fast adding up. Right? That's not what mathematicians have ever been interested in. He's interested in using this machine to think. Now, Patrick Blackett, perhaps, has other ideas. The government, surely, you know, famously, Churchill knows all about what's going on at Bletchley Park. The government will not lose this world-winning technology. And as far as I know, all of the documentation of that is still mired in secret secrecy. But what we do know is that at the end of the war, there are two computer projects in Britain, in Cambridge and in Manchester. And who gets the one in Manchester going is Patrick Blackett. Patrick Blackett recruits Max Newman to be Professor of Mathematics. Um, it's not just the coincidence that uh, Blackett being in Manchester that causes Newman to go there. Manchester has a long prehistory of uh, uh, pre-electronic computing. So uh, before the war for a while, Douglas Hartree was there as a Professor of Mathematics. Douglas Hartree reads about the idea of a differential analyzer, this analog computer, from America, he wants one in the university, they won't give him the money, so he builds one out of Meccano. Right, this Meccano machine, uh, and they use that, and they shows it to the university, and they say, no, we're still not paying for that. Uh, so he actually ends up getting money from a local industrialist to buy it, to get this machine running. Um, and uh, I hope you're nodding, because you recognize this from the top floor of the Science Museum. Um, people argue a little bit about whether you know, we should be repatriating cultural art artefacts, and I'm quite keen that we should, because I think this should be in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's a tradition of computing, and of course there's another tradition, the computer. Right? The computer in the 1930s means a woman who sits and obediently and re re repetitively does numerical calculations. Uh, the computer meant the, the, the person in the algorithm, and it was very often women, for reasons to do with you know, what was seen as a woman's role, what was acceptable work for women. Um, so you've got women in the background, you've got uh, analog computing in the background, and then you have the baby coming together. Now, <coughs> that story I told you about how the baby came together is entirely accurate. Right? So Max Newman had nothing to do with the design of this machine. Alan Turing had almost nothing to do. The thing he actually brought to, uh, the, the, the prime thing he brought, was that he'd been at Bletchley Park thinking about high-speed taping input. So this machine had really good fast taping input. Um, uh, but he doesn't affect the design. There's been some argument historically about who exactly came up with the instruction set for the computer. I mean, was it Jack Good? Was it uh, Tom Cooper? No, I, I'm not really very interested in who it actually was, so much as the fact that if you think about it, someone had to. You know, someone had to create the idea of an instruction set, and that's not a trivial thing when there's never been a working computer before. It's a conceptual, it's a mathematical, it's a software issue. But you need more than ideas to build this computer. You need steel. Right? So that building, that building on the uh, on Creeping Street, 
That was an extraordinary thing to happen in Britain in 1948, 1951, when it finally goes up. Because the currency of power in Britain, in post-war austerity, up at, literally, really up against it economically, Britain, is steel. All the steel in the country is being devoted to rebuilding bond factories to get Britain economically productive again. And yet, when the chief scientific advisor comes to see, and who does he come to see? This is Max Newman's diary. So in December 1948, after that trip, Max Newman is still the person that the, uh, the government science people are coming to see and promising they will give a little steel. Right? So the government is investing incredibly heavily in this Manchester project, and it's still at late, as late as 2014, it's doing it through the <coughs> mathematicians. And that's partly, of course, institutional uh, inertia. It's perhaps partly a certain degree of thing, you know, Max Newman is a, perhaps a, it seems from Whitehall to be a, more one of us to deal with, I don't know. Uh, but between 1948 and the appearance of the baby, the sheer productiveness of these engineers, really, means that control of the project moves out of the mass department and into the engineering department. So this is undoubtedly a creature of the engineering part. But of course, from this perspective, it's not really very surprising that the chief scientific advisor should turn up to see what all the government <coughs> money has been spent on as part of this years-long project to create computing infrastructure for the British military effort. It's not just he happened to be passing. Uh, as, as. But of course, if you were a young, well, you was a PhD student and a young assistant, First of all, you don't know about that. You know, the machinations that have caused your funding to be in place. I don't know if any of you were PhD students and look back and think, how did I get the money for that? It's your PIs, it's your grant givers. Right? Uh, so there's a different perspective there. Um, and what happens when that computer starts working? Okay, well, we'll come back to whether it does working. One of the very first projects that's completed on that commercialised computer is an MS thesis by a woman called Audrey Bates. She's done a mathematics degree, and she comes to Manchester. Uh, was she Matt Cambridge, or Manchester graduate? Manchester. Yeah, she was a Manchester graduate. She's recruited to do an MSc. She shares Turing's office. Um, uh, and she, uh, she or Cicely, remember how he was, really wasn't, didn't really think they should be there. He, they were a distraction. But, uh, so I think it may well have been <coughs> who got her to be there. And what's her thesis <coughs> on? Right? It's not on numerical solutions. It's on to provide a mechanical test by which two formulas can uh, transform Church's Lambda Calculus. Now, who's heard of Church's Lambda Calculus? Right, so you sat through some huge science theory. Course. Church's Lambda Calculus is the language in which you argue about what Turing machines can do or not. Or it's a language in which you argue about the formal properties of computing. <coughs> so this is a direct output from Newman's project of using this computer to do thinking with. Uh, I can't find the source where I read this, but I, there is some suggestion that perhaps the idea was that Manchester was meant to be the place where you worked on the mathematical implications of these tools and use that, and whereas Cambridge was meant to be fast that enough. And so in this building, there's an office for Kilburn, but there's also an office for Turing. So as we saw on the plaque, Turing gets recruited by Max Newman to come and be effectively what we call head of software. Uh, and, you know, there have been some arguments about what Turing's role was in the design of this computer, but I think it's more interesting to think about um, what was Turing's role in software and how this engineering tradition, computer engineering tradition, treated the idea of software. And the first way it treats it really well is it really needs it for marketing. Right? You've built the Ferranti Mark I. You're going to sell it to people who need it to do programming of stuff. Right? No one has ever used a computer to do programming. Who is going to pay these vast sums of money to do it? You need to sell this machine, and there's a brilliant guy called Vivian Bowden, uh, who was described by his boss as having a gift for ludicrous interpolation. <laughs> 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 and so, on the same day, probably, from the, uh, I would guess, because the same people are in it, on the same day, when they took that publicity shot of Tom Kelvin, 
They also take a publicity shot of Alan Turing. This is him here on the right. And Andrew Hodges, Turing's biographer, he's interpreted this picture as saying Turing is pushed out to the side. He's not part of the central one. And it's kind of true, and as we see that Turing is pushed out from the front, but not in this picture. Turing is here as the customer, right? If you're um, for Halstead or the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment or, or Neo uh, Tea Rooms or whatever, you're going to buy a computer to give to your mathematician, to your problem solvers, to say this will help you be more productive. And he's the example of it. And that's how it's used to sell the machine. But again, you get this problem of, well, how do you sell the idea? What, what's it going to do for you? And one of the things that marketers come up with is the idea is it's going to take your work away from you. So you, you formulate a problem, which is, of course, a really mathematical idea, and then you give it to the machine. And the idea is the machine will click and whir and solve the problem for you while you get on with your stereotypical leisure pursuit. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know who this woman is. I, I think she's probably a photographic model. And there's another shot on the same from the same shoot of a different woman, and she's uh, embroidering. <laughs> and the message is meant to be, this is, a, this is a machine that will take your problem away and solve it. Now, the reality, and you, I don't think any of you are going to be surprised, uh, given the complexity of what the problem they were trying to solve was, it wasn't like that at all. This machine is constantly breaking down. It's constantly having to be nurtured. It, you're constantly having to come up with strategies to cope with the fact it's breaking down, or just stopping working, or has to be taken out of service for a month while you do something or other. Um, and there's, a, I think, a really telling story by Mary Lee Woods. Now, Mary Lee Woods um, uh, uh, was a student in Birmingham, and she um, uh, came up uh, on the train to Manchester to be uh, interviewed by Ferranti, the programmer, uh, to s effectively to create the software that was going to sell this new machine. And on the bus up to Oldham, I don't know if you've been to Oldham, she said, I will never, ever, ever live in this horrible place. <laughs> but she gets to Moston, which is, uh, she gets to Moston, she has the interview, and it's such an interesting job. Being, yes, yeah, certainly one of the world's first computer programs, but she takes the job. Um, and among other things, she, she, I mean, she's a programmer her, her whole working life. When she has children, she's programming uh, on the kitchen table. One of those children uh, invents the World Wide Web. So, you know, she's doing all right. Um, but she remembers one of her jobs was to invert a matrix. And a uh, uh, big kind of uh, problem these machines are thought to be good. <coughs> she, she writes the code mathematically correct computationally correct in the sense it's, uh, you know, fits the instruction code, puts it on the machine, breaks halfway through. What does Tom Kilburn he said, say? He says, well, yeah, of course it breaks halfway through. You need to write some code that will save out the matrix uh, and then read it back in again. And she said, well, you know, but what, what, what code is that? Well, you'll have to write it. <laughs> so, this problem that she thought she was solving becomes a whole series of other problems about software engineering. And she felt that Tom Kilburn didn't take it seriously. And she said explicitly, he didn't take it seriously because I was a woman. And 50 years, late, 50 years after the baby, uh, she says a uh, uh, celebration dinner in uh, Manchester, and she goes up to Tom Kilburn uh, and reminds him of this, uh, rather frankly, I think. And he said, oh yeah, you were right. <laughs> and she just says in a reminiscence, uh, you know, I laughed it off. Um, so, programming is really hard, it's really difficult, um, uh, but it creates a new class of career. And that career doesn't really happen in the university department. Right? You get individuals, really talented individuals, coming into that department, we'll see a couple of them in a minute. But the real, uh, the place where there's opportunity, particularly for women, uh, is in the Ferranti lab. Right? Um, uh, in the university, officially, there's no uh, pay discrimination. Right? The professors all get paid the same. There just don't happen to be any female professors. There's only one professor at the whole university. Um, in Ferranti, well, there used to be this working culture of the operate the conveyor belt where they're producing all those radar sets or radios or whatever, and that was done by women. 
Um, uh, but when they create this entirely new career of the programmer in what Simon's really brilliant brought to life about, you know, the tin hut, the talking about that tin, um, where programming is happening, uh, Mary Lee Woods leads, an, leads a campaign for equal pay, uh, which she wins. And so it's creating a new uh, profession. It's open to talent um, without uh, uh, too many gender assumptions. Of course, this idea about the female computer is really helped. Uh, we mentioned one other uh, woman. Oh, this is Audrey Bates, right? So Audrey um, uh, is another one of these series of women who doesn't find a home in the, in the university department. She goes off to Ferranti and then she goes off to Toronto, uh, where one of the Ferranti machines goes. And she becomes uh, one of uh, Canada's computer science experts. And this is a, sh a shot from a few years later when probably the first remote use of a computer happened. Someone in uh, Newfoundland, I think, teletyped their problem mm. into. What's the um, Teletype there. Probably, I, I can't work out the mechanics of exactly what's happening, but they, they, they do a remote access. Uh, and this photograph, this is Audrey Bates at the front, she's the expert. In one of the university's archives, they, they caption her as Teletype operator. <laughs> <laughs> so, there are some issues going on about you know, who is entitled to be at this console. Um, and I, I, one of the things I just want to mention is. Turing's position now. So we said Turing is from this world that doesn't that doesn't. He's, he's he's been at public school. He's been at an all male Cambridge college. He doesn't seek the company of women. Um, uh, he doesn't really know how to to teach or engage with all the basis he's not well. He's not that good on the working class either. How to mix with the lower classes seems to be worth knowing. <laughs> but even supposing one had found a lot out about it. It might be difficult to write on the subject without hurting the poor dear's feelings. <laughs> Perhaps one would have to rely on their not reading it. <laughs> so I hope there's no one working class or lower class in here. So I'm, I'm mentioning these things because I don't want to come up with the idea that somebody was a bad somebody good. Everybody is working in, in the sense of you know, who they can talk to. One of the things I kind of only realised at the end of writing this book was um, how few black faces are mentioned in the history. Right? They're not, it's not that they're not there, right? The University of Manchester has got loads of, uh, uh, well, then transitioning, I guess, from Empire students to Commonwealth students. This man on the left is someone called Farid Ahmed. And he would come over on the train from uh, Leeds to do crystallography on the Marmite. Uh, there was something I was going to say about these crystallography things. So, um, so this is the output of uh, you know, one of these projects. The Manchester computer didn't turn out to be the key machine that British crystallographers really relied on to move crystallography forward. So crystallography is one of the key technologies uh, of the 40s and 50s. Um, you get a whole bunch of people, and again, perhaps because of its novelty, perhaps because, uh, well, there's, there's J.D. Bernal sitting in the centre center of crystallography. You've got a whole bunch of women around him, including Dorothy Hodgkin, who goes on to win the first Nobel Prize. Um, uh, in crystallography, um, uh, that doesn't really engage with this Manchester use very much. And play <coughs> doesn't happen that much. <coughs> uh, um, a, a list of uh, words for desire. Desire, wish, fancy, liking, love, from this longing, yearning, ambition, eagerness, ardour, appetite, hunger, thirst, lust, passion, fact. You get the idea. This is written by uh, a man called Christopher Strachey. Christopher Strachey is also firmly <coughs> out of that Cambridge mass tradition. He was a graduate at King's, like Turing was. He was gay, like Turing was. He comes to Manchester, actually literally, because he is Turing on the radio. And he briefly gets a job uh, working on that Manchester Mark 1. What does he do with his time? He writes a program to make love letters. <laughs> and the salespeople, uh, I'm, I'm generalizing really, the salespeople love this. How do you explain what this machine can do? It can play. Dietrich Prince, another figure who's drawn to Manchester, straight to Ferranti this time, he writes a program to solve chess end games. This idea of play. The principal investigators, Max and Newman, and maybe Freddie Williams, they would be horrified when this happens. When uh, Turing talks to the newspapers about how machines are going to be able to write sonnets, the next week, or the next day, um, Max Newman says, no, 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 that's not what the money was for. The money is to, to, to do research in mathematics. <coughs> now, in terms of marketing, of course, this is what you can explain to people. This is how you can explain what a thinking machine is. 
What you actually do on a Manchester computer, what Turing was doing, was working on morphogenesis. I, um, I'm wearing a, a, a name tag with pineapple on it, because this morning uh, I was uh, in a conference in Cambridge on the pineapple, and the reason I was invited to that bunch of, uh, uh, what are they calling it? Plant humanities, actually. The, the, so they're talking about you know, the, plant, the pineapple as a cultural. And the reason I'm invited is because there are Fibonacci numbers in pineapple. This problem about where Fibonacci numbers come from in plants is one that Turing had known about. This is a lovely story of him um, uh, at Bletchley Park during the war with uh, Joan Clark, who he was um, engaged to be married to. So, if you've seen the film, that's Kira Knightley. If you haven't seen the film, it's still Kira Knightley. What do they talk about during these precious breaks at Bletchley Park? They talk about picking daisies and counting the Fibonacci numbers in them. Now, I'm not going to make you do Fibonacci in a way, but I'm going to talk about it if you want me to connect it. Um, so Turing is working on his theory about where Fibonacci numbers come from in parts. That's what he uses his time for at the computer. It's playful. It's scientific research. He's one of the very first people to do exploratory mathematical modelling on electronic computers, as opposed to, you know, what's the wind flow? What will the yield be of the atom bomb is? What would happen if... Not the end. Um, uh, and he's one of the first people to, of course, do uh, structured programming. I don't know if you were ever taught to draw your subroutines and, and did it once and then realised you never needed to do it. Well, this is the time Turing did it, right? So this is his software design for his morphogenesis program. Um, and it's, he uh, had just been to Norway. Uh, and the reason he got to Norway was because I talk about the holidays quite a lot in my book, if you fancy reading about where we came to Wales, I've got it all in here. He'd gone to Norway because he had heard that they had um, all-male dancers in uh, Norway. And he went to Norway and he couldn't find them, because they didn't have a sign for them. Uh, but he did have what he said was a chaste kiss below a foreign flag. And that was with a man called Kjell, a boy called Kjell. And so he's called one of these subroutines, Ibsen, in Norway, and Kjell Plus and Kjell Minus. He's named a subroutine after, well, the man he hopes will be his boyfriend. So there's playfulness, there's exploration, there's a bit of space, and there's also thinking about the implications of what thinking machines could be, right? Right from the beginning, that's what, why Turing is there, that's why Newman, I mean, Newman stepped back from the day-to-day the -day running of it, that's why Newman's in. What happens when you've got thinking machines? And Turing starts to talk about that. I've mentioned the sonnets in the newspaper. And when that starts to get a bit of traction in the media, some heads bob up, the philosophers. Right? They say, OK, we, 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 we know a thing or two about consciousness. You know, that's like our thing. And the, the sole female professor, in fact, in, in Manchester, sets up a seminar in, uh, I forget the date, 1950, I think. Um, 1949, I'm glad you came to it. Um, uh, uh, to talk about the mind, uh, I think the computing machines and the brain. Uh, and Turing said, one of the challenges, I think then and now, to the idea of machines as computers is, how do you cope with contradiction? How do you, what do you do when you, when you encounter an error or a, a, a logical contradiction? Well, what Turing said is, well, what, what, you, what humans do is they just backtrack they go back in their reasoning to the place where they've made the mistake, and then they work out what the right route forward was, and then they go forward again. And this comment comes up, well, mathematicians might think like that, but are mathematicians human beings? <laughs> <laughs> and that laugh, that laugh is something to do with our uneasiness with the idea of taking consciousness, taking our humanity and handing it over to computers, to mathematicians. Interesting, one of the people that is lapidus in this debate is a man called Michael Polanyi. Uh, he'd been a chemist before the war. Um, he'd seen totalitarianism, both the left and the right. And he, after the war, stopped, stopped doing chemistry. The university to create a new chair for him. Um, they, they can't call it philosophy, because the, the faculty board won't, the, the, the governing board won't allow a new professor of philosophy because they don't need one. So they call it professor of social thought or something. But his, his obsession is that you cannot allow totalitarianism. You can't allow the control of science. And he sees the computer as a way of, ration, of regulating thought. So all sorts of things are coming together in this debate, which I, I talk about a bit in the book and I'm happy to talk about at present. 
But then, but then, in 1951, uh, 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 Antrim meets a different boy on the Oxford Road. Um, he says, hi, I'm the brain behind the electronic brain. Well, it worked on, it worked on the boy. <laughs> but, um, uh, and he starts up a relationship. This boy comes to his house in Wilmslow a few times. And then there's a break-in at Turing's house, probably done by a friend of this boy. But Turing is effectively being blackmailed not to report it to the police. But he refuses to be blackmailed, and he goes to the Wilmslow police station, which I have a colour photograph of, thanks to bus obsessives. Right? <laughs> there's lots of people who take pictures of the buses, so this is Wilmslow police station. And uh, he goes in, and he could have just you know, staged them, but he says to the police, Effectively, he said, I'm in a relationship with this boy. Uh, and that, right, the post war state, a bunch of things going on there, cracking down on lack of morality. The Home Secretary, the Chief of the Home Service, the Home Office, the, 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 the Catholics, they're appalled by the lawlessness uh, of, post -war, of wartime Europe, of uh, the way in which uh, the lack of moral structures allowed this brutality in Europe. They're cracked down, cracked down on conventional morality. That combines with increasing paranoia in the United States about the Cold War, got helped by the fact that the British British gay men have leaked atomic war secrets to the United to the Soviet <coughs> Union. Um, well they don't see it as leaking of course. Um, for all of these reasons, and perhaps because Turing is in Wilmslow and not in Cambridge, he gets prosecuted. I think one of the reasons why Turing came out with this idea, he essentially admitted his guilt, was that he wasn't guilty in the cultures he moved in. Right? That in suburban Wilmslow, even in central Manchester, if he'd been arrested, that was like a port city, it had found millions of GIs through it. Police weren't going to go around arresting every gay man. But in suburban Wilmslow, if you're seen as corrupting a young man, it's a different matter. So he goes to court. He uh, is sentenced to castration therapy. Uh, that's to say he has to take chemicals that will suppress his libido for a year. And this is the point at which I think Andrew Hodges, who wrote this glorious 1980s biography, really and quite rightly got enraged by the story. And I think there's still no substitute for reading Andrew's book uh, to understand the, the, the brutality of that as a treatment. I, I tried to find a little bit more about it in the book. There's not much uh, still to know, but he'd finished that therapy, though, by 1952, it's only for a year. He's depressed. Is that because of the estrogen therapy or because he's been publicly shamed as a sex offender? Probably the latter. I speculate myself, he's also coming up for himself against the constraints of early computing. That actually, that idea of turning your thought into a working program is much harder than the person who thought of the idea of working programs might think. Right? So that morphology, that morphogenesis work is much slower than he thinks it is. And then in 1954, of course, he found dead in Wilmslow. I'm not going to talk about uh, how he died. I don't have anything to add to that. How is he remembered by the Manchester Guardian? While at Manchester, he's one of the scientists responsible for the mechanical brains. Some of the ideas embodied in Ace, that was an early machine he worked on, were envisaged by him as early as 1935. Uh, and then they, they go into a bit higher that story. So, when he dies in 1954, it's kind of part of the story that he's part of this Manchester computing project. But as the years go by, he disappears from the honestly told story of what happened in uh, that Manchester computing machine. He's marginal. He was marginal before he died. He doesn't come into the office very much. He's doing things that people don't understand. Um, uh, and of course, the things that subsequently made him famous about what happened at Bletchley Park didn't even start to come into the public consciousness until the 1970s. But the real, I think the first turning point was in the 1980s when the first edition of Andrew Hodges' uh, book, and Trinity Enigma, came out. So Andrew Hodges, driven by this a uh, very powerful combination of indignation and mathematics, um, uh, writes a biography of Turing, uh, which has a very long, and if you talk to Andrew Hodges, you just 
have a pained face when we talk about the film, but a very long <laughs> gestation into a Hollywood film that kind of tracks Turing's emergence, not just into the mainstream, not just a figure that you know is yes interested in, but Alan Turing is perhaps the best well-known mathematician in the world. Right? You know, who who would you name? If you you know, my generation might have said people might have said, oh Stephen Hawking or Einstein or something like that. Who is it today? Who's going to be the new face of the 50 pound note, Alan Turing? He's become a global brand. And that creates some problems and some opportunities for Manchester. So, so in the 2000s, last time we had university expansion, um, the, U, the Mass Department got a new building. Uh, and it's a nice glass and steel building, uh, you know, contrasts architecturally with that Kilburn building as a type of windows. This, as this building goes up, it's just called the new building, and being mathematicians, they don't start with the branding. Uh, and to, at a late stage, they start saying, what should we call it? I'll be like a minute. So, so good for that. Um, they, what should we call it? And uh, they, at a very late stage, they think, oh, Turing. That would be quite a good name for our building. They, they, and indeed, it is called the Turing building. But uh, the head of the department at the time, quite a wily political operator, uh, and before he committed to that, he went over to his colleagues as such they are, in the computer science department in the Kilburn building and says, you know, we're planning this major new capital uh, investment, to name this major new capital investment in Turing building. Do you have a problem with that? You know, is there any major events you're going to do? And the answer he got was, we have no intention of naming any major inventions after in, in, any major investment after Turing. If Turing had lived longer, he would have set the course of computer science back even further. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I think they meant was that there's a remembered uh, account of Turing as hard to get on with, and certainly if you weren't on his wavelength, he had no time for you. So that's most of the women, not all of them, there's some recent correspondence showing him working really productively with uh, one of them. Uh, but if you're not, if you don't have that spark that makes him interested in you, he's not interested in you. He writes this ingenious but daunting software system. He writes the first programming manual, right, which is remembered, uh, brilliant account. Such a good, it was such a good programming manual because it was so full of mistakes that by the time you'd corrected all the mistakes, you'd work out how to program. <laughs> and it's from, <laughs> why is the world's first computer program manual remembered as hard to understand. It's perhaps a little bit more to do with the fact that it's the first computer program manual than it is to do with the fact that the person writing it. And it, it, it is. So this perception of Turing as a destructive to us getting on with the problem has sort of persisted, I think, all that time. And inside the department, uh, they, I went in, uh, I'm not a member of the department or of the university or any university in Iran, because if I was, I'd been a strike so I guess. Um, uh, uh, they, they've got a picture of a uh, young Alan Turing with this quote, those who can imagine anything can create the impossible. Now, as a quote goes, I guess that's kind of inspirational, and it's kind, it does kind of mean something, I think you could work out what it means. But the one group of people, the one group of people who would not say this sentence are mathematical logicians. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> create the impossible. <laughs> right, we're fairly sure we know what impossible means, and it's the things you can't create. <laughs> and of course, Turing never said this. Anyone know who said it? Benedict Cumberbatch. So Turing has become this brand that you attach to <laughs> quite rightly, and if you're the University of Manchester, you are exactly the same. I probably need to have an actual quote, but... Um, uh, and that's created a problem for this earlier history. Because as I said, that history, there's nothing untrue about that history, there's nothing unfair about it, but it just doesn't talk about Turing. And this is something I kind of grappled with since about 2001. Uh, so I, uh, as I said, I mentioned the Fibonacci stuff, that was my intro to Turing, I worked on mathematical biology. Uh, and I got invited to a conference in Manchester in, I think, 2001. Um, uh, uh, and there were a couple of speakers at that conference. One of them was Andrew Hodges, another was a, a historian who was working on this, uh, could we call it a revisionist vision about what the mathematicians had put into this Manchester engineering system? 
And the, one of those historians was effectively barracked at the end of his talk by the local engineers uh, because of a resistance to this story about Turing having any credit at all. But what stuck with me was a division that Andrew Hodges wrote. He put it on his website, he's never written it up. Um, Turing's assistance on software writing were women, Susie Popwell and all guys. This setup neatly confirmed Manchester stereotypes hard versus soft, engineering versus mathematics, William and Kilburns versus Neuro Newman and Turing, things versus concepts, north versus south, real Manchester versus virtual womenchester. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really interesting idea. And that really was the thing that I was trying to understand when I wrote the book. You know, can we know about what those cultures were like? So, you know, I've tried my best to uh, explore it, find the sources that I can. I've written up what I can, and you can read about it in this book. Unsurprisingly, there are no great answers, but there's some great stories. A, there are a few bits of gossip that I've left out of this talk. So, if you're at all interested, um, then you'll obviously buy the book. I haven't got very many copies with me, because I... Uh, technical reasons involved in Cambridge bicycles. Um, uh, but uh, there are a few here to buy. As I said, don't walk, if you walk out, you will cost you money. I've got a blog. There's a particular blog post on there talking about ethics and historicity, I think, talking about what I've talked about today. Um, I'm probably going to do an article for BCS News. And what I said was I was going to delay doing that until I had a chance to talk to you. So if you feel that what I'm saying is unfair or wrong, then now is the time to say so. So thank you very much. Hi, Jonathan, thank you for that. Uh, you, you, you actually, it hadn't struck me until I was listening, you, you're in the middle of three talks that we're having. <laughs> um, last, in January, we had uh, a talk on programming uh, Manchester Market <coughs> 1. We have your talk today, and then you were talking about the impact of wartime technologies. And the talk next month uh, is on exactly that, and as to which technologies contributed what to the uh, beginning of uh, electronic computing as we know it. So, ladies and gentlemen, question time. Who'd like to go first? This is really a Manchester nerdy question. Uh, you showed a picture of a seemingly derelict tall building alongside the canal. Uh, it's not by the canal. That, astonishingly, that's central Manchester. That's Piccadilly. So that's oh. where now the uh, Piccadilly Plaza is. Um, from Manchester, for instance, I say that's where that's the view from Primark. What the really question is that I have walked along the canal and seen a building very similar to that, certainly. And back, back in line with it is the big hotel. With almost exactly the same perspective yes, seen it's, so far. It's, yeah. it's, it's very similar. Um, and um, uh, if you come out of the station at Manchester, uh, you see a station, uh, a fire station, it's called London Road Fire Station. And when I arrived in Manchester, just like the Turing had arrived in Manchester, it was covered in dirt. And it really made me really understand, I, I sort of hinted at this in talk, the meaning of dirt in buildings. Right? So, Everybody, everybody, there's several pages of accounts in your book about people's memories of coming to Manchester. When Manchester was dirty, what it wasn't was rainy. Now, this, this perception in the south that Manchester is a rainy place, there's this sort of self parodic description from Cambridge that the, all the slashes, which represented zero in that part one, uh, so, they, the slashes represented the rain at the Manchester window. Manchester wasn't particularly rainy, what it was was grey. Right? All the coal was hanging in the uh, uh, um, atmosphere and creating grey stones all the time. That's what people remembered. Uh, London Road Fire Station has finally been cleaned. Now, if you see a dirty building, you think someone's not looking after that. But people didn't used to think about it. And this tiling is really interesting. London Road Fire Station, again, is covered in this very expensive terracotta thing so that once a year the, the fire brigades could come and clean it. Um, uh, and I, one of the pictures in the book is terracotta on the Oxford Road, just near where Turing picked up the boy that kind of was his undoing. Uh, so this is mixture of the industrial and the prestige. Um, when you're trying to understand what was it like, you know, to go from the backs in Cambridge to London Road Fire Station, uh, you know, I think you can begin to get a sense of it. 
Just a quick one, really. The, it seems to me uh, less likely that the, the government should put the huge amount of money you mentioned just for the benefit of building up a computer industry. Do you have a do you have a knowledge of whether they any of the for anti machines Manchester machines went into government service in atomic bomb well, calculations and all that sort of thing? Well, you're actually sitting next to somebody who can give you the authority to that. I'm going to get Wait a minute. Um, the, the other, so if the government has spent a hundred thousand pounds in that year on investing in the computer industry, it will be the only. Uh, widely directed government intervention in the British computer industry either. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think what I feel. Um, uh, you are, again, the documentation is largely missing, but I'm convinced that there was a high level belief that these machines were needed for defence purposes, including GCHQ. So, it's, of course, Colossus runs at GCHQ, uh, and Simon's traced the way in which GCHQ developed their own computing, but they also, they're the first or second customers of the Mark 1 start. So as soon as they built the prototype, worked out what's wrong with it, redesigned it, taken out quite a lot of Turing additions to, to make a working machine, they put the, this machine on a lorry, drive it to somewhere, I think in Scotland is, is the memory, so leave it in a lay-by, <laughs> with the keys in it, uh, for someone from GCHQ to come and pick it up, so it be installed as a computer. So there's no doubt that all the way through, people whose um, decisions are not being recorded in the public uh, arena are thinking, we need this technology and this money must be spent. So um, absolutely defensive future. Presumably, presumably we can trace right in, in the first few years each machine that was built. So, do you want to say something, Simon? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, there were nine machines in all. Uh, two were the original Mark I design, Franti machines, I mean. And uh, seven were the slightly modified uh, Franti Mark I star. Um, curiously, the uh, initiative came from nuclear uh, weapons first and uh, GCHQ was rather late in the field, uh, but they did come, and when they came, there was an extreme urgency. So I think defence uh, uh, was the key driver. Uh, the only one of the Mark Islands and Mark One stars that was not purchased directly or indirectly with government support was one that went to Shell Amsterdam's laboratory which, as far as we know, was the first uh, machine ever to be bought as a commercial decision. I forget what you're going to say. There's very good talk, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, it is speculation, I think, on my part, but I, I think that that does represent <coughs> a shift away from certainly Max Newman's uh, uh, original vision, uh, but also Patrick Blackett's so he was opposed, after the war he became quite notorious for writing from this position up high in the British establishment, these books opposing British nuclear weapons, to simplify his position. Um, so he, were, he was not happy with the idea of these machines being used for atomic weapons research. Max was perhaps a, a, a less opinionated. Um, uh, so that was a shift, a shift of, of uh, intention on some people. I, I don't know much about the background detail, but I believe that Ferranti had been involved with the British government for a long, long time before, oh, yeah. Yeah. and they built up a lot of confidence, uh, the, the government had a lot of confidence in their ability to deliver things. So that letter, which appeared to come yeah. out of the blue, yeah. was rather well founded on past experience of success. And it was Ben Luxpizer, I think, yeah. was it, who wrote it, mm -hmm. and he sent it to uh, Eric Grundy, who was the uh, director of Ferranti. Yeah. Who had the closest lease, had his finance or something like that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I don't know what happened to that letter. I've seen an original, a copy of the original a long time ago. Yeah, because I was made with his. Uh, with, uh, yeah. I mean, Fran yeah. I mean, Franti found a golden. Um, I, I don't want to use that uh, term. They found a golden um, source in the government that they 
for decades they had a, a model with the British government where they'd say, yeah, we'll build that for you, but you have to give us the money, or when you have to build the factory as well, and also we'll charge you the money for it. Um, and it wasn't really until they encountered Harold Wilson that um, they sort of ran into the sands with that the model. Um, so uh, you know, they, they contributed very greatly to the certainly to the war effort. Roger. Ah, sorry, Hi. Dan, and then I'll go over the other side. Um, there's a, a book which I read some time ago, and I can't remember the author's name, published by the Science Museum, uh, really covering the activities at National Physical Laboratory. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's, re uh, yes, reading it's, between the lines, I think, I, my personal opinion is that the best thing that Turing ever did for the Pilot Ace project was to move to Manchester uh, because part of his almost obsession with is this the mathematically right way of developing a computer, how big should the word be, what the precision should be, everything else, and keeping rethinking that actually led to quite a lot of delays in the development of Pilot Ace. Um, so, you know, once he gets to Manchester, he's got a machine that works and he can start using it rather than still having this cyclic, uh, almost squirrel wheel view of yeah, I mean, how it should be made. I, I, I've not um, read much about what happened in, in the ACE, and that's, that's, that's one view. I mean, I think another view would be everybody is on their hands to do Everybody is trying to work out how to do it. The machine's constantly doing that. What Turing didn't have at MPL was he didn't have the resources of a large lab given to him. I mean, what, what Fred Williams had was endless supply of uh, components and these brilliant circuit engineers from TRE. I think there must have been a high level um, instruction gone down to TRE saying, you know, support this project with all your resources. And I don't know why that didn't happen at MPL. Perhaps he's not seen as the leader. Perhaps he's not seen as someone who's meant to be making this project. That might be it. Maybe it's a bit of more, um, this is pure speculation, but maybe it was a bit more Charles Darwin at the MPL, sort of being a bit more opportunistic, saying that you should have that. I don't know. If I don't think MPL has ever been opportunistic, so I don't think that's true. But um, quite what happened, I don't think uh, we really know. Uh, well, I don't think. But. And so what I was about to say is certainly taken off by the previous speaker about Turing's legacy, but uh, I would like to point out that uh, uh, as far as the economic calculations are concerned, it is my understanding that the critical mass uh, of the ball was actually computed at the MPLS. I mean, I, I think that would bring to another question that actually I would quite like to hear some opinions about, which is I think almost all of those early computers were wastes of money. From the point of view, if you're, if you're an engineering director saying, well, how will we spend our resources to get the, get the product we need, the Atom Bomb, the Toronto Seaway, uh, whatever it is. Um, uh, I showed you the crystallography diagram. Right? That guy <coughs> estimate is one of the few estimates of the amount of time it took to compute by hand versus on the computer. And actually, it was fast. The project ran faster doing it by hand, well, punch cards, than by getting on the train to Manchester. So they didn't save money with those early projects. The people who are running these projects, of course, they're enthusiasts. They're people who can see the vision. It's going to be brilliant. Look at this, solve all our problems. They're supported by Ferenti, just mm -hmm. saying, yeah, it's going to solve all your problems. Mm -hmm. But you know, everyone in this room has been involved in computer projects that were too late, didn't solve the problem, didn't deliver. And then you know you hang on to those couple of brilliant successes where you just about managed to deliver something on time. What are the chances that the people who did it the first time around delivered? Actually, and of course nobody's going to write that. Nobody's going to write saying, you know, I wish we hadn't bought that Mark One. You know, it, it's like in the, in the, when I was uh, when I was at ICF, right? It was crazy, wasn't it? Nobody ever got fired for uh, buying IBM, right? Um, nobody ever got fired. For buying Mark One, so it's the future. Um, you know, I'm not saying that they, they didn't, literally didn't work. I'm just saying if you looked at if you took a project management point of view and saying what did we get for this money as opposed to using punch cards, say, and you know, crystallographers, it's not obvious to me that the ones who really made the progress in crystallography were the ones that had access to best computers. Uh, but that's 
an interesting question. So I think might have I'd yeah. like to respond to a yeah. number of things yeah. that you <laughs> raised. Yeah. Okay, kind of reversal yeah. here. It's on the program I have to the stack. Um, <laughs> I have a Cambridge background. If you read the three Nobel speeches from um, the people who got their Nobel awards based on science they did using Ed Sank to do their sums for them, they name Ed Sank as a contributor without which they wouldn't have succeeded. So they saw value for money in their context. Yeah. And they well, didn't buy their machines, they just the used one that was given to them. So they yeah. didn't have to do yeah. an economic analysis. Yeah. Um, so you need to be a little careful with the yeah. Um The real point I wanted to come to is I was a computer architecture PhD in the early 70s in, in Cambridge with Wilkes and had a number of conversations with Wilkes and Kilburn. There is actually a computer architecture reason why they felt if Turing had been allowed to continue, he would help computer science back. There was a big dispute about how you should design the instruction set. Turing was an enthusiast of something called optimal programming, which is essentially you design the fastest machine you can even though it requires vast ingenuity and effort to program it, because the key thing was to be able to do the biggest, fastest problem you could. And that's why the ACE actually had a number of successes, because it was the biggest, fastest computer. But it was hard, very, very hard to program, so your number of programmers was limited to the number of geniuses you could hire. The Cambridge Manchester philosophy was to build a machine that may, in a Turing sense, be inefficient, but was easy to program and build more machines so you get the effort that way. And that turned out to be the more successful approach to computer architecture. So if we'd stuck with optimal programming, we might not have seen computers be as successful as they are now. Though the double irony is if you take the top layer off an Intel microprocessor, you discover optimal programming going on in the well, layer underneath the, I mean, it. It's, it's like some very it's subtle it's conversation. I, 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 I think you hope you've got some more points, but to, to pick that up, right? Where where is computing happening in Britain? Right? It sits, that, means that baby sits in the entrance hall of the Science Museum. Every time I go there, I think, what's the rest of the story? You know, where, what happened to surround P2ICL? Where is the, well, a lot of computing is happening on the outskirts of Cambridge, right? Advanced research machines is, you know, creates billionaires, um, uh, you raise your eyebrow. Uh, you know, that, that, that's where the money is in Cambridge. Right? So Cambridge has held on to this tradition of software design. I don't think ARM is a, uh, a transparent program. It's not really, you don't really get recruited to be good at basic to work at ARM. Um, and I just wonder, I do just wonder whether artificial intelligence, you know, what's driving innovation? Right? It, it, it's not, you know, we require this hardware innovation, but where is it happening? Why is Google in America and not in Manchester, not in Cambridge? You know, why, why is this, these uh, developments being driven by artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, not really a, a, something that Britain is visibly top of the stack? Right? And I don't know the answers to those questions. But you've got to speculate a little bit that thinking a bit more about software and being willing to be a bit more theoretical about software might help. I, I mean, I'm not kind of theoretical computer science person, but um, so sorry. Is, there, is that a response to that point? Do you think it's a response to another point? Okay. <laughs> 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 the point I was trying to make was in terms of the match strategy when Plax went yeah. up, yeah. Um, and it was that generation, Kilburn and Woods, <coughs> as a computer architect, in yeah. a sense of hardware architecture. Yeah. They saw Turing as having gone down a blind alley, yeah. and thank God no one followed. Yeah. And even that's a slightly nuanced story yeah. as I tried to hint if you look inside, yeah. inside our processes yeah. as Intel ones. Yeah. Um, now you've changed the debate to AI, then Turing was clearly an early leader in that space. Um, and people in Manchester and Cambridge were, and some of us still are very sneering about that technology yeah. and its approaches, I think. Um, mm. It's another whole discussion yeah. about why things happened in Silicon Valley. There is a Google lab in Cambridge, yes, by the way, yeah. but it wasn't Google, it wasn't invented in Cambridge. Yeah. Um, but the whole search thing, which was founded, was done by a guy called Mike Burroughs, who was a Cambridge PhD, who went to death and built out of this stuff. Yeah. So we have a plane. You've got a huge thing. You've got a huge thing. I don't want to underestimate it. Um, uh, I have another point that I should probably should pick, take another question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, simple one. Um, can you just put the 
pace and juice into contacts. They're valve machines, and I think the Ferranti 1-1 would have been a valve machine as well, whereas Turin's main expertise, I studied under him, yeah. was uh, fast transistor circuits. Kilvin's expertise. That's what he actually Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, one thing I would like to ask in the room. So there was the technology. Yeah, yes, that's the technology. And, and that, that I, I think, I want to challenge on this if it's all right, I think, in a sense, the high point, the literal high point of, of Tom Kilvin's not literal, uh, career is the Atlas. Yeah. Right? So that's early 1970s. Well, I would say it's between 60 and 62 onwards. And it is, at one point in production, it is probably the fastest machine in the world. Yeah? And how many of them sell? So, of course, a large part of that is because it's targeted at particular markets of which there's only going to be. That tradition of Manchester computer or British computer building was a much longer and very productive and profitable, but dead end. You know, that, 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 I, I'm not criticising all the ingenuity. A lot of it just sitting in that room, this room, and it's not for reasons to do with the uh, expertise of the people sitting in the room. But when you're up against American military industry complex, you're going to lose. Uh, yeah, it's wrong to say dead end. That, that, I mean, yeah. one of the main things that came out of the Atlas project was virtual memory. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Well, uh, 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 twice at the same time, uh, two machines were rather common. Uh, that was the KDF 9 and the Burroughs 5500. Uh, the KDF 9 sold 30, the Burroughs 5500 sold 100. Mm -hmm. There's just no comparison. Uh, and, and that, mm -hmm. that implies mm -hmm. much more money. Which yes. therefore means that the US yeah. will go down. Yeah. And Europe, of course, was not the single market at that yeah. point, so it was hopeless. Yep, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, I agree with it. I tell you what, I'll go. Uh, sorry, first. <laughs> Well, my friend, we, we still only have playing computers, just they call Amazon, eBay, yeah. Google. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I think, uh, perhaps for me, sorry, it's like, I, again, I just want to hear your different to your opinion. I think Douglas Hartree has got the best sourced historical claim to the idea that there should only be uh, four computers in Britain. <laughs> right, so there is, there's no, there's, I've never found an actual contemporary quote of any of those claim statements about how many But Hartree did, he was remembered that he'd said, well, we'll probably need four in the spot to number one. <laughs> Franti Mark 1 yes. developed and offered for sale, so to speak. But at the same time, Leo, Lyons and Leo yeah. were starting to do useful work. Yeah. Uh, why wasn't the Leo experience, or the Lyons experience, used to sell the Franti machine? Well, cause, uh, the, the straightforward answer is because it was a commercial bribe. Um, and so Lyons, uh, the Lyons Leo comes out of the Cambridge tradition. Uh, and I, I did just briefly last week skim the book by Gina Ferry about Leo. Um, and it, it, I think Leo as a commercial line died out just because the Lyons management weren't very interested in it in the end. Um, although again, you've got to think, what does it really work? It's really saving money. Um, yeah, so that, that's pretty much all I know. But I think there are people in the room there's a whole economic story in the same with the British aircraft industry. The government kept the companies small in the hope they would compete with them, each other to keep the prices down, and they could never consolidate. Yeah. Um, and the Americans banged the companies together into the big giants, Boeing or whatever, in the aircraft world, and the same happened in the food industry. Mm. And they had a big market, so you had bigger companies, you had R&D resources in the bigger market, game over. Yeah. That's why we don't have an aircraft industry, that's why we don't have a computer hardware industry. Mm -hmm. You're getting into a very difficult conversation when you wonder about how we didn't exploit computer technology more from within this country. But uh, the point I'd like to make about Atlas is we did send a team. I was part of the team in America. We got several letters of intent from organisations like their Met Office, uh, Boeing, and whatnot. And they wanted to buy the Atlas 
But our friends in the American government brought in or, or just referred it all back to buy American Act. They wouldn't buy so much for the special relationship. But what they did do is they took a lot of the good ideas out of the Atlas system. And I don't know whether any of you remember the Multics computer. But that was designed by MIT on the back, more or less, hand in hand with Frank Sumner, who was the man of the Manchester guys. And basically, that would have been one of our sales, but we weren't allowed to sell it. And the Multics then took a lot of the ideas, and Honeywell made a good profit out of it. I, I want to just um, add in one extra thing, uh, just draw your attention to a book that came out uh, I think two years ago. Uh, it's called Programmed Inequality. It's by an American historian of scientist called Marjorie Hicks. And she talks Marie about... Hicks. Um, the, Marie Hicks. Marie. Marie Hicks, thank you. Uh, and she talks about um, uh, this cohort of talent that Britain created in the 1950s and 1960s, and then the way that <coughs> that talent disappeared. Uh, and primarily women uh, who were lost to the virgin abuse system, uh, system as it professionalized. Right. Um, and I think when you start to think about, you know, what do we lose when we lose these traditions of, say, software or thought, and we 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 fetishize the overalls, right? We shouldn't we need the overalls. We be led by them. But if all you are is someone that makes a machine, uh, you do lose the sense of ideas feeding into that machine. Um, and I think she made. I, I, I think. She uses her evidence to support a thesis rather than the other way around. But um, uh, she does make a good case that when you lose diversity, in, you lose neurodiversity, that's the really good thing, in these communities, <coughs> you perhaps do lose competitive advantage as well. So, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not speculating <coughs> from anyone, I'm just you know, speculating where there might have been additional credit for people listening to it. I fear that the clock has reached five past four. Uh, and we probably should draw this to a close. Uh, it, it, it's interesting. You, uh, I think this is one of the most vigorous discussions uh, after a talk that we've had for, for for a while. So, Jonathan, thank you very much indeed for the talk. Uh, and uh, there are, I think, a few copies of the book uh, at the back. Um, uh, two, two announcements. One, uh, in retrospect, I, I should have made at the beginning, and I was reminded quietly of it uh, in the questions. Um, many of you were here last month and heard Olaf Chedzoy uh, talk about programming the Mark I. Um, I did include in the calling notice for this meeting the sad news that about ten days after he spoke here, he died peacefully in his armchair at home. Um, uh, his son, uh, who was with him that day, uh, said that he was thrilled to bits to have been able uh, to tell us about programming the Mark I. Uh, and uh, in a certain sense, I think his son uh, felt that his father died a happy man. So, uh, sad news, but uh, I thought I should share that with you in case you hadn't noticed in the calling notice. Uh, on a happier note, all being well, um, our next meeting, March the 16th. Can I draw your attention to the fact it's a Monday? Um, the reason for this is that there is an event at uh, TNMOC uh, at which the speaker is uh, talking about uh, Enigma uh, on the Saturday. That meeting, unfortunately, is sold out. Um, but uh, he is here on Monday, and he's following on from a theme that Jonathan mentioned, which is uh, Marek, uh, Dr. Professor, Professor Marek Grayek, um, who is one of the world's leading experts on Enigma, um, has also looked uh, over a number of years at the way in which wartime technologies, electronics, radar, and others um, fed into the initiatives that led to the very early computers. And he's going to discuss the way in which, in his view, uh, these uh, technologies uh, actually influenced and, in some cases,
did not, in his opinion, influence the early machines. Uh, so it, it should be a, a, a thought-provoking uh, occasion, as I say. Uh, unfortunately, the Enigma meeting is, is sold out, but uh, he will be talking here. And Dermot Turing, uh, who has heard this lecture on uh, the early tech, well, the influence of the wartime technologies, uh, tells me that it's a very good lecture and uh, uh, a very thought-provoking lecture. So uh, that is Monday the 16th of March at 2.30. So can I invite uh, a final round of applause for Jonathan for today?